But there's definitely, I mean, I'm going to tell you a true story. I'm not making this up because this is, this happened to me. When I worked with a physician, Hashem see that. He lives in Australia now for the Australian people. So they'll confirm this. I had an eyewitness to this, but I worked with him, uh, in his office. He was a physician and we had, there was a, a, a man who came in and, uh, you know, he was, he seemed perfectly normal guy, but he was convinced that his wife was having a relationship with some, some invisible creature. And, uh, and he would, he told us these stories, you know, and you could write them off as crazy, but he did not seem crazy to me at all. Now, uh, and he, ha he would wake up in the middle of the night and there was something happening, you know, and, and he just felt the presence. And now, that same physician, we had another lady who was actually told us she was having a relationship with an unseen, and the reason she came is that she, he would come to her in the night, and they would have physical intimacy, and she would have this huge rash uh, when that would happen. That's why she was coming, but she, like, she told us in all, like, that was her story, so that's consistent with what's in the books that people do and there's there's books at, at borders and barnes and noble you can go to these bookstores about how to have relations with spirits how to invoke them how to come and what they'll come and what you'll feel and what you'll experience i'm not making this stuff up so there's people out there teaching people how to do that now the ulama differ about whether or not they do agree that jinn can uh can have uh, intimacy with humans, but whether or not there's an offspring, I mean, Imam Madik, uh, did not accept that. Imam Shafi'i did. So, um, Imam Madik just thought, even from that Sajda Baraya, that it would open up a big door of Fasad, you know, because they could claim they were married to jinn and things like that. But in the Shafi'i Madhab, al Aqad Bain al Insi wal Jinni is is, uh, can actually occur. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's definitely relationships, but again, um, you know, a lot of the things that we're given in Islam are to protect us from jinn. There's no doubt about that. And one of the most important protections from jinn is cleanliness, hygiene. And so there's definitely a relationship between uh, feces. I mean, one of the things when you go into the bathroom, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al min al khubti wal khabaith. You know, min al khubti wal khabaith to seek refuge from the khabitha and the and the uh, and the khabith, right? Which are the male and female jinn. So that's something that you actually seek refuge in when you go in. One of the reasons why you cover your head also is, I mean, even the, in the Jewish, they cover that small part because that's actually considered the part that needs the protection is is where the swirl on your, you know, just to keep from, uh, it's, it's in fact, the word in Arabic to be without a hat is hasir al ras, which also means to be unarmed, to be unarmed. And most religious traditions have a very strong encouragement for people to cover their head. Male and female. So males are encouraged. They're not, it's not an obligation, but they're encouraged to wear something on their head. Historically, people have always covered their head. Even the sun, just from that aspect of it. But there, there is a protection in keeping the head covered. There's a protection in keeping yourself clean. Feces, um, you know, a, a, a lot of crime scenes and things like that. People, when they go to these so psychopaths, to their homes and stuff, they're filthy. They're covered and often feces and urine. And so there's, there's definitely a relationship between that mental illness and, and the jinn. And obviously people get opened up to unseen worlds. I mean, I mentioned a book by Van Doren called The Presence of Unseen Worlds. He worked for s several years, couple decades at Sonoma Napa State Mental Institution. And he, I read that book from cover to cover. He began it by just arguing that he was a complete materialist when he went into psychiatry, but by the end of working with these, he became very convinced that there really are uh, creatures. That, And he said some of them were benign and some of them were malevolent. And he said it was very clear to them that auditory hallucinations, 
he said some of it was mental illness. It was just problems in the brain. But he felt others were clearly real, that the people were not making it up, that they were really hearing things that were actually there. So, Allahu Adam, I mean, in the end of the day, Allahu Adam, all I know is that we believe in jinn. And jinn are unseen creatures. In terms of how that plays out in the real world, I'm in the same boat that you are. Like I said, there's a lot of weird things out there. There's a lot of people that believe weird things. I think a lot of it is, ex you know, explainable. I would argue that if you have people with mental illness, I would go uh, to try to treat it medically before I'd go to an exorcist or something like that because uh, a, a lot of hallucinations can be stopped by uh, certain drugs that are very effective at doing it. So, and and people that have mental illnesses, now we can treat a lot of those illnesses uh, with with drugs. On the other hand, I think some mental illnesses definitely, there's something more going than meets the eye, and Allah, Allah knows best. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll give you an example. I know somebody who, they were having a lot of problems in their house uh, with noises, and, and their, their daughter was begin, getting very uh, trouble and started like having and uh, you know I gave him some du'as to do about just getting Jin out of the house and things like that and he came back to me a couple months later and he said that it's completely gone his daughter was fine everything complete after he started doing those du'as so uh, Jin will respond to Vicar um I mean, uh, there's Uzma's father, he's going to kill me for bringing this up, but, uh, you know, her father was in Los Angeles, and uh, he heard some noise, and uh, he, he just ignored it, and, but then in the morning, he found a giant boa constrictor in his, in his house, and, uh, and, and he said, Warabi uh, Suleiman, you know, you know, like, by the Lord of Suleiman, get out of here. So he was like commanding him if he was a jinn, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, if you find snakes, because jinn tend to, jinn can shape shift, and, and they tend to take, uh, they, they take, uh, you know, cats and dogs and, and, uh, snakes and different, they can take different animal forms. Um, and that's how you'll see them if you see them. You won't see them in their, in their form, but they can go into other forms. And, uh, so he just said, you know, by the law of Suleiman, leave, you know, and the, but he didn't leave, which means he wasn't a jinn. If it was a jinn, they'll leave. So the Prophet Islam said, if you come into your house and there's a snake, you should ask them to leave. For Don't just, don't just kill it. Just ask it to leave, because he said it might be one of the believing jinn. And if they leave, they'll leave. Uh, and just let them leave. And if they don't, and they're harmful, then you can kill them. You have permission to kill them, so... What's that? <laughs> no, no, no. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَصْفَاءِ سَرْخَ النَّاسِ الَّذِي وَسُوسُ فِي وَسُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Don't worry. Alhamdulillah. They're gone. I just got rid of them. Lajnoon. Yeah, well, Majnoon is also, it means the hidden illness. Because you don't really know a person's crazy <laughs> until you, I mean, sometimes you do. You know, I had some people a while back brought somebody over to my house that was stark raving mad. And I was really upset about it. And that person ended up, you know, doing a really heinous crime, so. But, uh, you know, some people you can just see it. You don't need to look very far. Ma and madness, you know, may Allah preserve all of us. Because madness is real. And, uh, I mean, historically Muslims had a kind of a lot of benign madness. They had a lot of jadid as well. What are called mishdubs. Like you're in Morocco. Have you met any mishdub? See, when I first went to Morocco, there were a lot of mishdubs. There's not, now there's more mad people. Because Muslims used to have majadid more than majanin. The majdub is somebody who is mad, but they're mad in a very religious sense. Like, that, you know, they're very devotional people. And 
and people leave them alone, you know. Um, and, and in Morocco, there were quite a few when I first went to Morocco. They're very interesting. I mean, you don't want to spend too much time with them because they're it's a lot very powerful. Mad people have very strong presence. You know, it's very dark, and you don't want to get into that. People that work with mad people, if, if you've worked in, you know, it's it's a very taxing job. It's a very hard job to be around mad people. I mean, even being around neurotic people, you know, people that aren't well. And and in our culture, in our planet today, most people aren't well. There's a lot of imbalance on the planet, just humans. They're not well. They're not doing well. As this, The human project is not going well. You know, so there's a lot of problems with people. And there's a lot of good people out there, but there are a lot of people that are really suffering. A lot of suffering out there. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of mental illness. There's a lot of instability. The Prophet ﷺ said that one of the signs of the end time was Takfir al-Hawsat. You'll see a lot of mental instability. Um, Sheikh uh, Habib Ahmed Mashur told us that the treatment for that is to do dhikr, but to do balancing dhikr. Certain dhikrs are dangerous for people. You know, dhikr is like medicine. There's over-the-counter, and then there's prescription medicine, and not all dhikrs, you know, people can go mad doing dhikr. They really can. Their spiritual psychosis is very real, and I've seen it happen to people. If you start doing a lot of divine names, you can really uh, hurt yourself. So, but things that will not hurt you are prayer on the Prophet him. You can do that as much as you want, and it will just benefit you. It will not harm you. Istighfar will not harm you. Um, La ilaha illallah is, you know, if you do a lot of it, uh, you you can you can get some pretty intense experiences, but it's not a harmful. But if you do certain divine names, they can be very, you know, uh, dangerous to do on your own. So, that's why the religion is about balance. The Prophet did not like ex excess, even in the religion. He did not like people to do too much, because you can really lose your balance in doing too much devotional practice. You don't want to do too little. You want to find that balance. And uh, and that balance depends on you also. It depends on your environment. To do a lot of dhikr in southern Morocco is not a real problem. If you start doing a lot of dhikr in southern Chicago, you might get into some serious trouble. You know, because of the, the, the types of environments that you're living in, one culture supports your dhikr and the other is actually antagonistic to it. So it can create the kind of cognitive dissonance that really can be problematic for people. Anyway, it's it's a you know it's a it's a it's a uh, big topic, big topic. 